another community call. Thank you all for coming. We have a few of the items on the agenda, but the first one is more the uh, announcement type of thing. So in the Slack channel, we are going to archive the power user channel and essentially merge it with the community channel. So from now on, if you have any power user business, just go to the community channel. The reason it has been done is because we would like to reduce the number of different entities or different entity types on uh, research hub. So it's not as uh, confusing for the newcomers, given that we are rolling out the editor program soon. So yeah, and just be on the lookout. We will go through many changes soon. And I will keep giving you details. All right. So uh, we had a wonderful suggestion yesterday that we should develop something resembling the standard work instructions. So it would essentially be a set of documents that uh, depends on how detailed we want it to be, but yeah, it contains details about how, like what are, what is the mission, what is expected and what are the procedures and resources and et cetera for uh, active users specifically we think for, to roll it out for the editor program and so i invite everyone to the discussion what do you think in the upcoming editor program should be in this document if you if you here are have applied to be editor so you, you can share like what kind of instructions directions and resources you would like to have and easy to access document type of thing I think we we can have a um, shared notion page where because like you guys said it's not settled about the responsibility in detail so perhaps it will be changing on weekly or monthly basis so if there will be a shared notion page at least for like a checklist to remind editors of you know the weekly um, boxes to take after the uh, at the end of the week, if you can, you know, please check if you have done the following. So, and then perhaps a shared scheme where they can update um, the core team on their progress and whether they, you know, have feedback on those features or not, something like that. And also um, perhaps uh, in terms of the token reward, because we from my understanding of the last meeting that we will be blending some of the and delegating some of the responsibilities to editors so perhaps there will be a guidance on you know how to do that and how how many tokens should be rewarded per comment or per up, uploading you know etc and also on the technical side i think one thing um like you guys said in the editorial program um you know the technical guidance on how to remove scam and some, you know how to remove papers low quality etc so the technical side i think that that's pretty quick to get on board but maybe the checklist thing i think um should be there to remind us because if it's changing, it, it will be quite chaotic in the end, I think. You're absolutely right. I think we will just start uh, from scratch now, now and we will eventually crowdsource it to be, you know, a big uh, all encompassing document, but we are just looking for, you know, ground things type of uh, document. And I think you're absolutely right. We need, you know, the technical details on how to flag, remove uh, spam and stuff like that. I what I have written down is also the more specific checklist of things to do, right? And uh, kind of like a shared place to share feedback with the team. Is that right? Or or did you mean something different? Is this... Yes, I mean like like a, a shared scheme where they can actually update the core team, you know, of their progress um, either on a weekly or monthly basis. Just a, you know a quick update and also a place for them to give feedback, even though they can perhaps contact you um, directly. But I think like everyone can see that and we can work on that within the team. Sounds very good. Um, anyone would like to add something on this standard uh, work instruction document? I wonder if there's going to be any element of tracking what editors are doing in their respective hubs. 
Um, of course, there are going to be sub hubs that are more busy than others, uh, but I don't know if there's any plans to um, for like editors to sort of briefly fill out updates or something like that of what what it is they're doing, whether it be outreach or you know they're working a lot um, uh, with comments and and you know giving rewards, just something to give um, something to collect some data about what's happening and what editors are doing. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think yourself? How much uh, supervision would you would you like if you were the editor? Right. Well, I mean, naturally, I, th I think a lot of people don't like supervision, uh, but it would be less of like a supervision and more of editors sort of just coming forward and being like, OK, you know, this week I found that I was doing this a whole lot or, you know, I, I was deleting a whole lot of spam recently, um, something mm -hmm. like that. So not necessarily like um, a requirement. But it's also going to look strange if editors are not open with what it is they're doing, and it's not apparent when you visit their hub, right? Um, it's just right. an opportunity for editors to be like, you know, here's here's how I'm keeping everything rolling in in this hub. So yeah, you, I think what, what Lee said very much, you know, uh, resonates with what I said with a, like a share scheme, where every editor can see, or or do you want it to be transparent or not to be shared? I think if they post their progress each week or each month and then their feedback or, you know, what are the things that they've noticed so that everyone can discuss. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be transparency. Um, you know, we can fully acknowledge there's going to be some hubs that are more busy than others, mm -hmm. but uh, there's no reason not to be open with everything that we're doing, um, especially with, you know, the sort of mission. Would you like this to be an asynchronous discussion platform? So like a shared document where we, you know, share weekly reports and see how is everyone doing? Or would you like it to be synchronous, similar to this, but only for editors? We can also have just a Slack channel, perhaps, just for editors. Okay, uh, the Slack channel, channel sounds like a good idea, but definitely something along the lines of what Xing is uh, suggesting, which sounds like it's more asynchronous um, and could be certainly more convenient given the time zones that we're spread out amongst. And we can all, always have synchronous meetings if there are, you know, some issues that we want to discuss in person, I mean, virtually. Okay, we had a hand uh, from Scott. Yeah, it, I agree with you, Scott. With different time zones, it will be hard to get people to get, to a synchronous meeting. So yeah, maybe perhaps we would like to start with an asynchronous document where we will have to come up with a structure, right? Um, some sort of weekly updated document. But would that do you think would that work? Because there will be a number of editors. This document will probably grow pretty big pretty fast. Well I'm, well, I'm a little unfamiliar with like how the structure of the document could work. Like it could just be one giant document or a document that links to um, other documents for respective hubs or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm just sort of brainstorming here. I'm, I'm, I can't envision what it is you're describing. Right. I mean, there is nothing in particular. We will have to figure out how it works. Yeah. If it's hard to manage, maybe we can do like a self-reflective kind of thing where every month you ask, you know, what what are you thinking of the program so far? What are the issues you've noticed? Kind of like a Google form and then you can collect the answers and then we can discuss maybe. Um, yeah, so definitely asynchronous, I think. A lot of times um, what happens kind of in startup environments too is you can have like quarterly one-on-ones where in theory like you can have like Anton or myself or um, someone else who steps up in a leadership capacity in the editor program essentially like conduct interviews with other editors help collect like you know feedback on a call and then like actually write down notes that can then be like shared with the core team in order to like help I guess like distill the feedback into something more actionable. Um, just an idea, but that's kind of how we do things internally. And I've seen scaled in large organizations. I think I'll say, um, I'll go with what Zinc said, but then instead of a month, you could just 
um, do it like weekly. Yeah, like a, a weekly review, and some kind of a checklist or something. So it wouldn't be that bad. Yeah. So Joseph, you would prefer a weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, someone from the team? Yeah, that won't be bad. If <clears throat> with time, I, I don't think this will be scalable. But then I think for the meantime, that, that will help. Right, we can look into that. Um, I really like the ideas of contacting the author and getting feedback. Yes, and uh, in this way, maybe we can scale in the sense that maybe if it's an interesting topic, maybe we can do a webinar or something, or I'm exaggerating but i think uh it's very interesting because as i said many people don't have access to uh, some information and um, yeah for some people it's interesting to discuss some topics and maybe they could become investors or i don't know members of the team yeah, yeah, I mean, outreach to the offers is definitely something we are looking into. We try to be find this balance between, you know, so so that we are not too annoying to the offers, right? Because the offers already receive a bunch of uh, messages like that. However, you you propose an interesting idea. What do we think would be the formats of activities we should invite the offers to? Like, what should they? So let's say we do get a hold of the offer. What do we want them to do in say in the, in the short term? Maybe hold a Q&A session or something like that? Yeah, so we can ask them in this way, somehow it's a promotion even for, for them. Like some, um, for example, uh, at my university and even when I apply for jobs, um, they are asking, um, where I posted those research papers and uh, if I can provide a link or an explanation, like it's more trustworthy like that. And um, yeah, I don't know, maybe we can j just propose as, a, as an option. Like if, you, it, if it's a new top, top, topic and I don't know, the author it's, available to discuss maybe he or she or they will be interested to participate so you're saying we should inquire them in what capacities they would like to interact with the users of research hub yes and even us i mean if we are maybe we can ask them questions if it's something interesting but it's it should not be like um something compulsory just an idea because i i, I really liked this contact the author or get feedback because i don't know some people post things and maybe they're just copied or some people do not receive enough um recognition as they should or they don't know how sh how they should receive this recognition. Do you think at this point Research Hub is populated enough for like big offers to consider it a, a viable outlet for, to gain popularity? Yes, of course. Mm, for example, I did a virtual internship. It's called Upkey, and uh, there were like people from all over the world who were just like volunteering and they were very interested in in gaining more knowledge and um, the time constraint was so little so we couldn't like for example they they, uh, they were speakers and um, if a speaker was talking about i don't know artificial intelligence um, maybe the speaker didn't have like the time to to discuss about the subject but the students were <clears throat> very interested but because it was in in um, like coordinated by upkey 
we couldn't like contact the author like that. So maybe, and there were like authors who said, okay, you can contact me, no problem. But it's other way if we can have this option, like for the author, if the author wants to discuss or to express his, uh, his ideas, because some people like maybe they, they didn't express their idea as they wanted, or I don't know, to be, to be an option. To help yeah. share a little context here, um, I think one of the motivations was like six months to a year ago, I had a little bit of success where um, I, I went through Reddit and looked at like all the most popular posts on our science, posted them on Research Hub, got a couple of people to ask like sort of interesting questions about those papers, and then emailed the authors, whoever the corresponding author was on that paper saying, hey, we're Research Hub, we're this new forum for scientific discussion. There are a couple of people who wanna talk about your paper. Here's the link, here are their questions. Like if you wanna show up and answer the questions, it'd be greatly appreciated, thank you. Um, and I got a response rate of like 30-ish percent. So yeah, 60% of people were like, nah, screw this, <laughs> you know, I don't wanna do it. But um, they just ignored the email, you know, not, no harm, no foul, it was very respectful. And 30% of people actually showed up and like wanted to talk about their paper with interested people. So that's, that's like a pretty good response rate for a cold email. Um, so yeah, I think something like that, where we could have community members help to organize like which papers we talk about, um, like help to bring questions on the paper and then organize like the email outreach just to, to scale it to have like lots of authors every day in theory show up to research them. Yes, awesome. Do you all think that would be a comfortable thing to add on the list of things uh, we kind of expect editors to do? Like once a week, contact an author of one of the popular papers on your hub. Eventually, that sounds like a fine idea. Um, I'm still getting a feel for um, how quickly things move in a hub um, because I've you know, primarily been poking around in psychology and neuroscience and medicine. Um, and it still seems like things are, aren't moving too fast. Um, but again, like, I, I don't think my sense of how a weekly thing like that would, would work, uh, well or not. Yes. Do you I mean agree the with Lee. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I agree with Lee. First of all, the workload on a weekly basis, I think is, yeah. Um, not very realistic, to be honest, in the long term. And second of all, I think at the moment for most of the hubs, asking the editor to contact the hottest papers um, authors on a weekly basis. Um, I haven't thought this through, but sorry if I sound negative on this, because from my experience, um, most people, maybe, you know, I'm biased, but most people around me, if we receive a, an email from ResearchGate and say, oh, people are discussing your paper, 80, 90% of the chance we just delete that email, to be honest. Um, yeah, but maybe I'm just being too negative here. Would uh, reward... I definitely agree. If the if the users of the hubs um, gets growing really fast, that's something we can definitely do and to like organize online seminars or forums to discuss those papers. Um, but at the moment, at least for the hubs that I am engaging with, I don't think that will be very very attractive. Per um, either you know from the uh, audience size kind of uh, perspective and also. Um, you know, how we advocate research hub is another issue because perhaps some of the authors would just think of us as spam or something and just delete the email. So perhaps um, like you guys are uh, currently designing a one pager, maybe like a graphic something um, to properly introduce um, research research hub first, like Patrick did, maybe a code email, but a bit more personal one. Like we are discussing those bits about your paper, not like a too generic one on weekly basis. Um, I don't think that works really. If we are going into detail, um, it's very realistic in the long run. Yes, great idea to, to keep it short. And 
Yeah, I guess we also should keep in mind how much people can engage with people we invite to re to to like talk about stuff or like do something because in some hubs I can imagine there are a couple of users who are doing something pretty uh, on daily, weekly basis, and like another couple of just random people passing passing by. And asking a person to like spend their time, asking a person every week to spend their time to come for four people is kind of not a great idea. To be honest, from my experience, because I organize seminars and conferences, etc., and if I only expect the audience size to be around 20 or 30 scholars in a Zoom meeting, I wouldn't dare to invite the professor because they won't be very happy because of the incentive and their recognition. So perhaps I would do a bit more networking and just um, invite more external um, scholars to join the seminar discussion. Um, at least they should expect like 40 or 50, you know, if they dedicate two hours and then you need to consider their preparation time on, you know, the presentation or discussing their papers that they posted a long time ago, etc. So the preparation time is quite a lot for the professors too. So if they are coming, they do want their time to be recognized and they do expect a slightly larger audience size. And at the moment, it, um, at least for the hubs that I'm engaging, I don't see that I can easily invite 60 or, or at least 40 um, users to come and contribute um, you know, quite useful suggestions or discussions with the professors, with the authors at the moment. Yeah. But but I think it's optimistic if we, we grow very fast in the next couple of months. Yeah, so maybe, I'll, 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 go ahead. But maybe they can invite some some colleagues or some students or whoever wants to be invited because even at my university, it was this issue, like we have a hot topic and there are not enough people to, to know about it. So maybe it could be an idea, but it should not be uh, weekly or I don't know if it's an agreement or a consensus or something that we are interested. Okay, I don't, <clears throat> I don't really know if I'm rushing into things, but then I think instead of um, cold emails, um, in-person seminars, or like some kind of workshop, very popularized one, in, in inviting um, the young, the younger master's program students instead of the old, the older professors and all who, who wouldn't really appreciate the new um, blockchain technology and all. Yeah, I think that would be, um, be quite would, would give us the avenue to express ourselves better, explain things better to people instead of just a short code email which, which couldn't explain too much and might even end up getting deleted as they say. Yeah, I don't so know I if it's, it's too much to say about it. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I, I think it's kind of like the long term goal, right? Maybe like a year or two is to have like Nobel award winning professors, you know, show up and give talks. But in order to get there, I think we it's like taking steps in building community. And so having like master students, like early career researchers, postdocs, where we can start to populate some of these hubs. So that way, if like a Nobel Prize award-winning scientist publishes a paper and we have 15 really insightful questions on it, then it's much more attractive for that person to show up and answer them. But it, it's, it's a great idea, Joseph, because it's about taking the steps towards that and like building the community to where all of a sudden it's like whoa there's a lot going on like people are talking about my papers so that's a great call okay. makes sense that way yeah thank you yes i definitely yeah. think phd students would value that opportunity more yeah. yeah but we still have to keep in mind what we can offer in return right so especially if we talk about not PhD and master's students, but let's say associate professors who are early in their career there in my experience are the busiest people possible and they're like trying to set up a lab and teach new courses and set up their research in the new institution all at once 
right? And if we are talking about PhD students and master's students and postdocs, people are working on very short contracts for <laughs> very little money. So we, we should keep in mind that if we are inviting them, it should be at least some kind of decent CV line, right? So we can give them an opportunity to, let's say, give a workshop in front of like decent audience or like put the, some kind of like big CV line in their big line in their CV, which would mean something, not just I was in Quora kind of forum for five minutes and I answered some questions. Olga, to, to jump on that idea, um, do you think a YouTube video would be helpful? Like one thing I've noticed is some like PhD students who market themselves via YouTube, where like if you search their paper, they like do SEO, you know, on their paper, where like say, say I'm like a, a postdoc program or like a hiring committee. When I search the person, they've already curated like their search results to where, oh, there's this charismatic interview of them, you know, speaking to a lot of people who are asking cool questions and they're responding like intelligently. Like we, we could help set that up where it's like we help their SEO that then ends up helping their career long term. W would that be kind of what you're talking about with like a, a, a resume CV booster type situation? I think it's very hard to say because I can see like hiring committees seeing it as a show of efforts uh, without any you know substantial contribution and i can see hiring committees being very excited about that so i think we can we can keep it in mind in the, as an option and i think it's a great idea and like not every pg student goes to academia after that right so offering this as a option might work for sure we might try to frame, do the same thing, but just frame it in a different way, right? So if it's just, we can make a hackathon or something, right? And uh, a hackathon funded by Research Hub, you can put it on your CV. I think it's decent enough to put in your CV as a, for academics, maybe as a supplementary, right? But for people who work in like organizations surrounding academia, that would be a good enough line to be, to put in the CV as is. Okay. Right, any more suggestions about the contact the offer feature? Should we move on to other topics? All right, so we have, several people have suggested the idea that we should have a roadmap. It is slightly, it, it is complicated in a way, right? But, uh, the roadmap as is, I think, would be doable if we include just the, the past, the past uh, accomplishments, right? The, the features introduced in the past that perhaps will be helpful for people who all just start using Research Hub and they do not know how it was developed, maybe for a bit of a context. As for the future features, uh, we what we can do is we, what we can try to make it into a somewhat of a DAO, DAO-informed decision-making apparatus, right? Think about this way, right? So currently, you know, the team works on the uh, electronic lab note-taking feature. If we would like, as a community, to introduce a topic for, not a topic or a feature or some, some sort of development that we would like to introduce in the future, we can try to put it on this, several options on the roadmap and perhaps vote on them to indicate what we would like to see next the most. Discuss. <laughs> Useful, useless, doable, not doable. Sorry, are you are you referring to the technical side, like how to be on the website, or I? No, more more of a big picture type of mm, representation of the development process, right? So mm -hmm. 
how it started, what features were introduced, right? So the hypothesis feature it was introduced, the lab note-taking journal is in being introduced now. And some people are curious what would be in the future. And it through our limited vision, we can try to direct the development towards some features more than others. So that would be more like a graphical depiction of uh, our preference, I guess, for the development. Yes. So you just oh sorry. Go go ahead. Yeah, yes, I mean it's the same at Xing Xing. It's a it's a Xing. Okay, at Xing said to not um overcrowd the website and the hubs and yeah, to keep it simple and organized. So that wouldn't be on the website, right? That would be a document that you could look, you know, that you can find on the Slack or perhaps in the about uh, page of the website, for example, as a supplementary material, more or less. Olga, I don't want to speak until you have a chance to go. No, I was just like trying to understand how does it look like? Right, so it's some kind of like bulletin board kind of thing where we are kind of voting for what you want as a community. Do I understand it's it's right? More or less, uh, Patrick. How how impactful do you think that would be if we would have a board? Like I would put the whimsical together, right, and I would just delineate what has been developed recently and kind of like put the three, four. Uh, features that people are talking about the most and just add some basic voting functionality, kind of? Yeah, totally. I, I think what would be the most helpful is for us to easily see like what the community collectively wants us to build. We, we have like some ideas about what we think would be useful, but there's uh, regulations in the United States that make it difficult for us to openly share them. Um, but the community is allowed to say what they would like to have built. So yeah, just like it even can be as simple as like a like a Reddit post where people upvote and downvote ideas. Um, it could be whimsical. It could be like a Google Sheet. Um, yeah, basically something whatever format needed to help inform us what the community wants to see built. If um, I'm understanding this, oh sorry, sorry. No, go ahead, Jing. I forgot you. Yeah, I forgot you. You should speak first. So. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, I think it would be super useful to see the history of the roadmap, roadmap um, and where everything came from. Um, and it would also be good to have an idea of what features may be coming next that you're allowed to talk about, along with what features the community may be interested in. And some of those features will probably overlap as well. Um, so that might foster um, thinking about the development as well. That's what I wanted to say. Go ahead, Ching. Yeah, I, I'm just a bit confused because in my understanding, I know it's like a Hebrew mode at the moment because of the legal kind of issues that we need to um, be careful. But in my understanding, if we're doing a vote like a DAO, shouldn't we be based on like the tokens we hold and do like the the DAO way? Um, because if we do like a upvote or downvote, then we all have one vote, for example, and it's not weighted, right? If I'm understanding this right so it right. wouldn't be based on your past contribution to the community and it wouldn't be very fair to the core team members like you guys um the early contributors because i definitely think those who are contributing much more like like patrick and anton um should have more votes in the same compared to you know average users who's been contributing much less um, because you understand how it came and you know where it's going much better i believe in the early stage it should be a bit more selective in that way not selective weighted in that way for your votes so if we're i mean i'm not sure if we if we do like a normal vote like a google one or something already one um is it still makes sense does it still make sense um i'm a bit confused sorry so it's a great point jing thank you very much for saying that um yeah, it's, it's hard because the legal situation is very undefined. Um, our attorneys have advised us not to vote in any DAO votes uh, with our own coins. So in theory, anyone on the Research Hub core team is not supposed to use coins that we've vested in order to vote in any DAO votes. 
So the idea here, and, and I actually agree with you in that, like, for instance, Anton has been contributing to this project for over two years. He's done like a ton of work and has influenced like the community drastically. But his opinion should definitely be worth more than someone who shows up tomorrow. Um, he also has a lot more coins than someone who shows up tomorrow. So kind of like, I think what we could do here in theory is snapshot. Have you ever heard of snapshot? Um, that's like a, it's an off chain, um, like coin holdings weighted, like you plug in your Ethereum wallet and then like you can vote based on holdings. And the idea here is that this would not necessarily guarantee what we build because the core team, you know, has been here even longer than Anton and we'll, we'll end up building what we think is the best, but we'll use this information to inform what we think is the best. So like, um, our, our team in general, like customer feedback is what you build, you build what the customer wants, right? So this would help us decide what we want to build by having information of like what the community collectively thinks is the most valuable. And perhaps we can switch to a real DAO vote once the community matures, right? And the legal situation clarifies a little bit. There's this kind of phrase of like progressive decentralization. And so like the, the long-term plan, because this is going to be a project that in theory, you know, is going to be around for 20, 50 years, that over the course of like three to five years, enough tokens will be distributed where then our legal team will feel comfortable that we can start to vote in the DAO. And so once, once there are enough coins out among the community, then we can start voting. But that is, it's unclear exactly how long that'll take. But it, it's it's in the you know, two to three to five year kind of time frame. Um, yes, that was exactly what I was also going to say. Um, this whole DAO thing isn't really old enough and hasn't been battle tested enough. So I wouldn't advise any company starts with a DAO, but initially should start more centralized so that the co-founders who know but uh, who, who you know the, the mission and the vision of the project the assets and up kind of guide it in the initial stages before if the doubt will be formed then um, then it's formed later on i think that's the best way to go about it and just form a down or decentralize it in the initial stages i, I don't think that's that would be too healthy yeah my two cents I have a question for Patrick. 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 Um, it's the legal issue about the United States or overall? Like, are the attorneys concerned with the equivalence of the tokens uh, in US dollars or they are afraid that we might use? the tokens for illegal activities outside or i don't know no yeah it's just purely the united states it's, okay. the, the us has not given clear regulatory guidance on how these projects should operate so uh us in general we're we're being extremely conservative and trying to do everything the absolute right way so yeah our, our legal team has advised us to be as conservative as possible in order to basically uh comply with the limited guidance that has been given from like the the us regulatory apparatus. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. All right, we have two more items on the agenda. One is a quick one. Uh, so we currently need, to, we currently have no for regular users to add, no way to add the hubs, new hubs. And you know, as the community grows and we get more specialists in the narrow and narrow fields, we would need to introduce them. and so i think the easiest solution for now before we have the the dao vote or some other structure when when it's too much of us to handle would be just if you would like you or other user would like to create a hub right for a specific uh, subsection of or field of science just contact me or patrick preferably me and uh send me send me an image send me a name of the hub and send me just a two sentences of the description and that's that's pretty much it if you also could attach a link to some sort of taxonomy that proposes cre uh, having such an area that would be super helpful as well 
right? Is there um, any way to, like if you create a new hub, is there any way to retroactively um, tag papers that have been posted in the new hub if they're applicable? That is a great question to the engineering team. <laughs> Yes, definitely. You definitely can. Um, in in the paper, there's like an edit paper button, and then there's a list of hubs. I can uh, screen share and show right now, um, in theory. So, just one second. Bear no, I, I thought I thought like automatically. Like if we eventually we introduce the hierarchy, like the nested hubs, for example, the cognitive psychology would be within psychology. If we should, well. Yeah, I, I do see here that the in the edit function that there's a way to manually do it, um, and I think that's good enough for now, for sure. Um, especially for the editors who might be, you know, digging around other hubs looking for you know other ways um, to um, expand or work on their own hub. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, it can be manual. Um, there are some pretty cool ML projects that exist right now where they're trying to classify scientific papers just based on the text. So like in a future state, I think it can be done automatically. But yeah, right now we'd rely on kind of manual tagging. Cool. Okay, Scott, Scott, I suggest maybe we hide the uh, hubs that are not currently sufficiently populated just to increase the legitimacy of how it looks and everything. Thoughts? Yeah, um, it's hard to argue against that. It's probably a wise choice. Yeah, I agree with that. What would be the sufficiently populated point? A hundred papers? I'm, I don't know. I'm just throwing a number out there. Do you want to do it like based on papers or active users? Well, that's it, it's not going to have very many active users if it's not open. I don't. Well, I guess then maybe <sighs> instead of hiding a hub, if it's like a brand new hub that maybe an editor wants to be in control of, um, then maybe as part of being an editor, like your number one priority first is going to be going through tagging a bunch of papers um, and creating an environment where your hub is going to thrive. Like that should be probably priority number one. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're you saying we should just give the editors option to temporarily hide it before they clean it up and they impopulate? If if it's not a hard thing to do, you can do that. But I think you know an editor should be able to accomplish that in no less than or no more than two weeks. Like you know, building a healthy hub from scratch. I can see. So um, I have to bounce this off the team to see if it's doable. But but we could do something where like there are some hubs that have like a decent amount of traction right now. But for the ones that don't have traction, we could like minimize them until at least one editor is signed up. And then once an editor is signed up, boom, the hub's open. You know, open for business. But like you need one editor in order to say, okay, somebody's here and actually maintaining this thing. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, so what I was thinking is like if there is less than one comment anywhere per week, that's probably dead. <laughs> so if there is an editor who posts something at least once a week by himself or themselves, it works. <laughs> it's a life. Um, when you talk about hiding, you mean hiding it from the editors or everyone? Because I don't know if someone just wants to randomly post a paper in any empty um, hub, would that be possible? Or you just hide, you're hiding it from everyone, or just the editors? Just some regular users, I think. Oh, you're hiding it from the regular users too? We could do something like um, just on the hubs page, maybe just to help make the hubs page a little cleaner where we don't actually remove any papers or anything like that. But just when you go to the hubs page, you see like the most active hubs. We, we did something like trending hubs a little while ago. It doesn't work perfect, but basically where the most active ones show up first. And I think this is similar in concept to that. So um, we'd have to talk to the engineering team because this does sound like there'd be a little bit of work put in in order to like have you know, uh, editors claim hubs and have them like be like unminimized. But um, I think the idea is pretty cool. So I'll, I'll bring it up with our uh, engineering team and see what they think. 
Yeah, but I think the idea of hierarchy, maybe, because as Joseph said, no one wants to know that the paper is in the it's in danger. So like yeah, as you did with the trending or maybe the engineering team will yeah, will decide better. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I my mind might have misspoken, but yeah, I don't think we ever discussed like deleting actual content or like hiding it. We were mostly talking about the, the, the interface, maybe in the hubs folder. Yes. Okay, and uh, we need to transition. And uh, Thomas, are you going to present the new sleek designs we have? I'm going to do it. Um, I'm sorry I, can... I left a little time for that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, and this is a design exploration. So um, these are just some ideas, definitely not set in stone. I don't know 100% if we're going to use this, but the idea is we're doing a work trial with someone that, um, in theory, we'd like to hire as their head of product design. And so as part of her work trial, essentially, we asked her to just uh, redo all of our most popular screens. And so um, the goal here is to kind of modernize the design and uh, make the UI UX of Research Hub a little bit cleaner and nicer to look at. So I'll share screen. We have like maybe like 30 different screens here. So um, you have to just bear with me for one second while I uh, um, kind of walk through everything. So let me see. Can you, can you guys see everything? Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this would be the home page in theory. I'm actually very curious what you all think about this. Um, some of the main changes is that the hubs section is moved to the top bar. So the hubs would be in theory personalized for every user based on um, either what they visit the most or the order of what they visited last. So in theory, this user would have seen neuroscience, and then before that, psychology, and then before that, COVID-19, so on, so on. We move the um, uh, click-through here to the left in order to have new users sign up. One of the other big changes is on Research Hub right now. We have new post. Here it would be submit a paper. Um, this bar would allow for different post types kind of similar to like we have here, but slightly cleaner design. And then uh, also very importantly, we'd love to hear what everyone thinks. Uh, instead of having kind of like the Reddit style, like single row of papers, um, this would be two rows of papers. It looks a little bit more like editorial, kind of like a newspaper, um, get a little bit more content above the fold, but each paper would have kind of less information on the homepage. Uh, before I move on, uh, curious what everybody thinks about this design. Overall, is, go ahead, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. No, I was just wondering, is, is there is no uh, user comment live feed in this version, right? Yes, yeah, no live feed. I mean, it, it definitely looks clean. I like to submit a paper. Um, the only thing that I'm tripping on is the are the two columns. Um, I'm I'm guessing that the left one is all and the right one is trending. Um, this is probably just a minor change thing to show or clearly, you know, visually understand that one is this and the other is that. Uh, because as it stands, it's a little um, ambiguous what's happening here. I think this yeah. is all right now, but it's sorted by trending. That's great feedback, Lee, because that that is confusing. Like that, that's a very good point. And our team in general thinks that it should be one column, and uh, the designer likes the two columns. So that's that's why we're showing everybody here is to kind of like grab everyone's opinions. And that is confusing. I could totally see why someone would think that. So that's great. I feedback. don't, and I'm I'm not really getting. And again, my opinion is just you know, it's just the thought. Um, I don't see the value of having two columns. Um, I'm worried about overwhelming the person who's visiting the website. 
Whereas when we look at the current design, at least with the single column, um, with you know the main action, what's going on the papers and some information, um, it's a lot more digestible, even if it's because we're used to this sort of format from other websites like Reddit. Um, but when, when I look at the main page as we have it now, um, you know, it's pretty easy to process and I, the single column is helpful. There's latest activity and then helps on one side. Um, I like the direction that this is going, but I'm just not sure about um, all the information that's presented, you know, at once in these two columns. And that's not to say it's a bad idea. I'm just not, I'm just a little hesitant about it. Yeah, that's exactly what we need to hear is people's kind of like top level feelings. Because when new people show up, that's what they're going to think. And then if they're like, oh, I'm overwhelmed, they'll just be like, oh, X, I'm out. So th that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also confused why we have like the same paper in both columns. So if one is all and the other is trending, and I would assume that all shows uh, it's in chronological order. So the newest are the highest. And trending is also kind of tends to show off newer uh, papers. So they will repeat each other a lot, which is I may appreciate two columns, but not with the same content. Totally. This is just a design. So she she didn't fill in like um, unique content for each one. It's just like copy paste to sort mm -hmm. of showcase the design. OK, yeah, yeah just. So, on, on our site, it would be it would be different content. Okay. Yeah, and I um, guess like I can I can clear up the 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 all in the trending thing. So all would refer to papers and hypotheses and discussions. So all of those would show up in under all, and then the trending is like the sorting how how we sort these uh, mm -hmm. posts. So like we could change it to like newest or top rated or something. But yeah, that's what the trending is there for. It's a great okay. example because this shouldn't need to be explained. Like it should, yeah. like it's the yeah. same color. Like this should maybe be purple or something. Like that's, it's great feedback. So are both of these columns um, displaying all trending or is one column all and the other is trending? It's all trending, yeah. Both columns are the same, like uh, from the same feed, sort of. I personally think it's more disturbing the first like left left join us and top members the idea with trending in my opinion it's awesome because as we said it helps with the votes and with the engagement so it's more disturbing like join us it's a, a lot <laughs> can i and, ask what what yeah. the oh i'm sorry go ahead no that's just my opinion that the copy like the words specifically not the like the colors or the placement no i mean the whole thing the whole column we join us and top members maybe it could be it could disappear or it could be like instagram type more focused on something like di directly i don't know interesting maybe it could be on the right as well what was the perceived benefit of having two columns rather than one? Information density. So if you look at our homepage now, you get like two and a half papers on below the fold. A lot of times like people won't scroll down. So in theory here, you can get six papers uh, before people have to scroll down. M most people will show up to the website, be like, oh, this is cool, and then leave if they're not intrigued. And so in theory, you can have more content to intrigue people and encourage them to scroll down and see what else is there. So when you're referring to the idea that people don't scroll down, are you referring to your data from the website? Yep, yeah, our user okay. data. And that, that's like websites, social websites in general. Like it's good to fit as much as you can before you make people scroll. Yeah, another thing is to put trends in or like maybe put the something like sort by trends in whatever 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 and put it on different line because when it's on the same line as all papers hypothesis discussions it's not intuitive that you can like click papers and click trending for example because they're in the same line and it seems like there is only one choice 
totally so maybe like put it on the other line and like do something sort by yeah that's a great point i guess one specific question i have is the lack of a comment live feed here um what do you all think about that i personally think that live feed that we have now is kind of confusing and overwhelming so i am all for getting rid of that but yeah is the current live feed um does that contain all activity on research hub yes on this page uh yes like the home page it will show all the activity on the whole site if you go to a hub it will show only the activity in the hub yeah and th that's why it was confusing and, and overwhelming because there is no way to filter it by your own hub or like your papers you posted and like track the specific comments for example so it would be great to have it somewhere but like, like more customizable maybe yeah great point and, and just uh to to be kind to everyone's time here we're at an hour now and there are maybe like 30 screens here maybe like three big screens so um if you guys are okay with continuing to share feedback i'd be happy to go through everything or we could just wait until next community call so yeah cur curious what you all would like to do uh well we covered a lot maybe we can just hit whatever is left anton but i think there's still you know a lot to think about um, seeing, you know, this is all really awesome, all these changes and stuff like that. So I don't want to downplay it by sounding negative or anything like that. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's a lot to think about between now and next week as well. We could definitely plan um, a little bit more uh, specifically for next week. Just a, just a... totally, yeah, an hour is a really long time for a call. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to pay attention for me, at least for that long. So that makes sense to me. I guess one thing I would like to hear. Um, we are experimenting with a like comment sidebar. So I'll see if I can zoom in here a little bit. But what do you all think about having the comments kind of uh, adjacent to the paper rather than currently um, below? I like it. It seems like a live conversation. It definitely seems more appropriate when there's a PDF of the paper to be looking at at the same time. Yeah, maybe we can even, this is like maybe a sci-fi suggestion. <laughs> maybe we can like even make some kind of special editing tool that would refer in a comment a particular line in the text. Does that we already have that. Huh? We already have that. <laughs> You see, not sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, do you think that we should try to work harder to showcase the inline commenting, or is nobody using it? it it's interesting because I love the idea of inline commenting, but people aren't using it organically. So we actually just removed. We used to automatically, um, essentially, like extract text from papers that are open access, but um, we it was like maybe 80% accurate. So there were some weird kind of like uh, math equations and stuff that would come out. But we had the ability to highlight text and then comment directly on that text, but people weren't using it. So it could have been a UI thing, like it wasn't obvious enough for people, you know, there weren't enough examples, but we removed that feature for the time being, but it will come back once our ELN is ready because um, people will publish text native to Research Hub that then can be highlighted and commented on. Yeah, I didn't know it existed, so. That does sound like an awesome feature. Great to know. That's actually super great to know, because we were like, oh, why isn't anybody using it? But if no one knew about it, that uh, we need to do a better job of actually like making it obvious you can do that. So when people commented in line, was their comment also copied into the comment section or not? It would come up on a sidebar. So it would, oh, okay. there would be a sidebar that would show up here. Maybe, then, maybe initially it was quoted too mm -hmm. in the comment section, but gotcha. Maybe maybe if you do switch to this com sidebar yeah. comment, and it would be more you know organic to that format. Yeah, just put everything on the sides and have like discussion with like these pins 
one of the other benefits, sorry, um, one of the other benefits of this uh, layout is if I navigate to this paper, right? If I'm on the home page and I'm like, oh, cool, this is a cool paper, let me check it out. I don't see any comments. I have to scroll down, or even a better example would be one with a comment. Where are the comments? I clicked on the paper. Where are they? I have to scroll. So it's below the fold. So I have to do that. Where in this like paradigm, I would click on the paper and boom, the comments right there. So I know people are discussing like as soon as I click on it, I don't have to like kind of stumble upon it by scrolling. Sorry, I'm a bit confused because most of the papers that I've seen um, are only include a DOI, DOI link and abstract. So if we bring back that feature of you know in text commenting, how are we only going, going to comment on the abstract? So what we had before a paper like this that's open access and the PDF is shared, we were automatically extracting all of this text and rendering it within the web page. So this would come out as like uh, like the font would be similar to this, like all the way through, like actually in Research Hub's page, and then you could highlight it and yeah. like stuff would pop out to the side. Yeah, I've seen papers like that, but I think for most papers that are not open access, perhaps we can only, you know, commenting on the abstract on the side. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the side comment section. Maybe I'm the only one here because I think it's a bit more gamified, like gamification kind of mm. effect, I think. Um, maybe if we bring the in-text comment back, that could be a very bonus and interesting point on the side. And then if we are discussing on the paper in general, maybe we can still leave a section beneath. I don't know if you guys think that. Because if we're only commenting on the, the side um, section, to me, it looks like Facebook, <laughs> if, even though um, the UI is quite neat and clean, but this section alone looks, I think it's a bit like gamification. I think I understand where you're coming from, Shang. Yeah. And yeah, like if if you know one of the major things is going to be scientific discussion, discussion it should have like a dedicated space front and center um, so that it doesn't feel like brief comments or anything like that, like actual discussion. Yes, thank you. Would it be, so would it be possible to have, like when you just open the paper, it, they are on the sidebar, but if you scroll down enough to the actual comment section, it transfers back, it converts back to the previous centered comments? Totally. Well, one thing we talked about is like the sidebar would be for specific points in the text. Like if I wanted to highlight a sentence, we'd use the sidebar. Yes. Like if you wanted to comment on, hey, this figure looks weird. Why is it like this? But then there's also another comment section about the paper as a whole to say like, yes. I think that this paper is not good enough or this paper is amazing. Like holistic comments versus like specific criticism of exact portions. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's a good idea. Jin, can I can I ask you um, one thing you said, which I think is really interesting, which we commented on as well. Um, you said ga gamified in a negative light. Can you can you expand on that just a little bit? Because I think Maybe this is I'm being a bit too nerdy here. Because I still want you know I, I like the new version, which like the fonts, the UI, the color, everything. I think is much better than the old version. Um, but this side um, commenting one is. I think a, a bit far from serious academic discussion, but like you guys said, at the moment, it's more like a Reddit thing. So perhaps that doesn't matter, but I absolutely uh, am on board with Patrick, uh, what you suggested, um, which I think align with my uh, suggestion is that we comment in text, um, like briefly on the side, because if you post like 500 words, no one's gonna read that long uh, on the sidebar. So like a brief comment on each, like the, the text, um, in the comment section. And then if we're going to discuss this paper in general, we comment on the beneath comment section, I think. It leaves some room for like more serious um, academic discussion. Whereas the sidebar maybe is like, what does this sentence mean? Or, you know, um, maybe someone will suggest if you want to read more, go to that book or something, things like that. Yeah, but definitely not a 500 words on the side. I won't read it to be honest. 
Yeah, this is an amazing point. Yeah. There's kind of a, a tension within our design between uh, like uh, making Research Hub like usable for the layperson, but also attracting like high quality scientists to share high quality comments. And so we need to think of a way where it's not unprofessional, like where high quality mm -hmm. scientists aren't turned off by the UI and still feel compelled to actually share their high quality thoughts while also I think maybe later on making it welcoming for the average person to come in and like learn about science. So yeah, it's kind of a tension that we deal with, but Jing, it's like very helpful to hear you say that because we, we would never get to where we want to be if we don't attract the high quality scientists. So we need to make sure that we don't lose them initially. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can like- the author can have a specific place, like for example, LinkedIn does, it says author, or maybe his comments could be up into the space, or maybe we can add the hide comments section. One other thing we thought about too is having like a uh, like a academic comment section versus a casual comment section, where like maybe if it's in your hub of expertise, like the casual section is hidden and the academic section is like displayed. But if you went to a hub like outside of your expertise. You would see the casual one like basically trying to make a distinction between like people who want to have a high quality conversation versus people who are like cracking jokes or like kind of you know doing more reddit style comments so it's we thought about it a lot and not sure like it's it's going to be a continual debate for a while so any feedback you all have kind of in that area is going to be very helpful Um, yeah, so I think I think that's pretty much all we wanted to share on the designs. Thank you guys so much. That was uh, super duper helpful. So thank you. All right, that was the last items agenda. Thank you all so much for staying over time. It was very helpful. Thank you guys. See you next time. Bye. Yeah. Thank Thanks everyone for coming. Bye. 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 -bye.